with this lecture, it's going to be Eat for Life. Dr. Furman is going to discuss the nutritional excellence to enhance lifespan and to prevent and reverse disease. Dr. Furman completed his medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and is board certified. And I have no idea. Uh, I thought I was on quiet. So he is. Back, Dr. Furman, we've introduced you that, and we are ready for you to proceed forward. Can you just say hello so we know that you're online? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Microphone's up, and we'll give you the floor. I think you'll be able to see your slides as well. He's going to demonstrate them to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Looking forward to being here, and I'm excited about talking to you today. Just waiting for the slides to go up so I know that it's working. Okay, it's working. Okay, great. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good, good. All right, so I'm gonna speak pretty rapidly because we only have an hour, but I was told we can go like five to 10 minutes over in, during the Q&A part if people wanna to stay to, do, to finish up with questions and answers but I'll try to go as, um, to give as much information as I can, because to me, I'm very passionate about this information because I've been practicing this field of, you could say medical as a, a nutritional medicine for almost 40 years now. And I routinely see that um, almost all my type two diabetics become non-diabetic within six months. And all the patients who come to me on blood pressure medications I'd say it's very rare that a person isn't off their blood pressure medications, except in the extreme elderly, let's say, is it within a period of a few months? Um, and we generally see the reversal of autoimmune conditions using a nutritarian diet. And that includes not just rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis and psoriasis and Sjogren's, and, but also um, eczema and asthma and allergic type conditions are able to re be reversed not just treated and controlled. So my motto is not really um, treat and control disease. I, I look to reverse disease so people don't have the need for medical care and medical interventions and medicines for the rest of their life, giving them the hope and the expectation that the miraculous self-healing properties of the human body can be given full reign when you establish a degree of nutritional excellence. And what I'm claiming here, these radical sound like radical claims, what I'm claiming here is the same dietary portfolio that slows aging and maximizes human lifespan is most effective to reverse disease when people have ser serious ailments and can be used therapeutically um, very effectively. So let's get into that. And I'm saying that we can push the envelope of human longevity instead of people dying around the age of 80. We can narrow the bell, meaning instead of people you know, living between 60 and 90 or 60 and 100 with a huge scatter of where people are going to fall, we can narrow the bell so even people with somewhat weaker genetics can still live to be 95. And the bell can be you know, between a 95 to 105 range and the natural lifespan for a healthy human, especially with these modern advances in nutritional science is around 100 years old. And that means a healthy with a healthy life expectancy without dementia or physical maladies preventing them from being um, physically uh, mobile and mentally alert. Um, so let's get started. And I'm going to discuss here some basics before we jump into that, is that food gives us nutrients that are necessary for human survival. And the two types of nutrients are macronutrients, which, are, which contain calories, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And water is also a macronutrient, by the way, but I'm not considering that right now here. But I'm saying that the excess macronutrients that humans consume in the modern world, especially in our country, dramatically shortens human lifespan. And there's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. And that fat on the body spews out lipokines, cytokines, free radicals, makes people more insulin resistant, activates aromatase enzymes, which produce estrogen, and of course, promotes angiogenesis leading to cancer. So fat, so we're designed to be a very slim, low body fat um, animal. And for males, even a body fat at more than 15% is 
um, increases risk of shortens lifespan, increases risk of chronic disease, and for females to be healthy, um, advocating a body fat percent below 25%. I, I always give this joke and I say, half of what we eat feeds our needs and the other half of what we eat feeds the needs of our doctors. And of course, food gives us micronutrients too. And micronutrients are vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, those non-caloric portion. And what I'm saying here is that a healthy diet has a high micronutrient bang per caloric buck. And I'm also, that means to have a healthiest life expectancy possible, we wanna have a diet rich in nutrients in the amount, but also in the exposure to the variety an assortment of wider variety as possible of, of, of micronutrients per calorie. And I'm also saying here that when we achieve micronutrient excellence, then we desire less calories. And the reason why people become food addicts and overeat and can't control their eating behavior is because the American diet is 60% of calories from processed foods, 33% from animal products, and only 2% from vegetables, which are the most longevity promoting foods. But so what I'm saying right here also is that when your diet is phytochemical and vitamin and mineral and antioxidant deficient, we build up more circulating inflammatory compounds, more free radicals that keeps us chronically fatigued and desirous of more calories. So when we fill our body with good with a lot of nutrients, it, it reduces the metabolic waste products and also, obviously, it stimulates the hypothalamus apostat to keep our desire for calories lower, and that you can't just willy-nilly cut back on calories without focusing on nutritional quality of what you're eating to be able to desire less calories. So I'm going to give these five words here, and these five words I want you to write down or remember as the most critical factors of the primary principle that governs human longevity. And they're the most effective proven methodology to slow aging and live longer. And that is these five words, moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. Those are those five words, moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. And I'm saying here that when we achieve micronutrient excellence, then we desire less calories instinctually, and we gravitate towards the right amount of calories, which is considerably lower than the, way, much the, way, than the amount of calories people are eating today. And I'm saying here that this lower calorie, high nutrient intake slows the aging process, reduces inflammation, suppresses genetic alterations. Scientists call this gene silencing, meaning the abnormal or um, disease promoting areas of genes are silenced and can't be expressed. The BRCA1 gene, the GSTP1 gene, these breast cancer genes, for example, are not expressed when a person with a high green vegetable intake who, is, who has a lower body fat. So we're saying here that we enhance DNA repair, we enhance the removal of, of toxins and, and um, cross linking agents. And of course, the ages us, AGEs age us, these advanced glycation end products from eating commercial baked goods and, and cooked and darkened and browned and cooked substances and increased um, glucose moieties that stick to our cell membranes age us rapidly. And the body reduces these factors with high nutrient, lower caloric intake. And there's one thing of interest here I wanted to mention, and that's slowing, slowing the metabolic rate that when we, as we lose weight and we get to our ideal weight and we're not meeting our caloric needs fully, the body wants to maintain its body mass. It doesn't want to just willy nilly lose more weight. It'll slow its metabolic rate down to maintain its healthiest weight. And in doing so, we'll lower the body temperature, lower thyroid function, lower the respiratory quotient of calories burned through breathing, and we'll slow the caloric burn. And in doing so, the body will age slower. When we gain weight or when, we, when we're overweight, we're, age, we're speeding up the metabolic rate. So let me, so it's like 3,500 calories per pound of body fat. So if I ate an extra, let's say 100 calories a day over and above my basal metabolic requirements, that would be 100 calories times 350 days a year would be about 10 pounds of fat you'd expect to gain for each 100 calories you eat over your basal metabolic needs. So I had 200 calories extra a day, I'd put 20 pounds on after the end of a year 
of over eating more food than I need, right? And the answer is wrong. That's not what happens. Because as we take in more calories than we need, part of those calories will put fat on the body, but the body tries not to turn it all into fat. It knows how bad it is to gain weight. The body wants to maintain its healthier weight. So it'll try to speed up the metabolic rate to try to burn off those calories. So you'll only gain 10 pounds after a year of eating, overeating 20, 200 calories a day, not 20 pounds. So the body will, will like making a pact with the devil, it'll shorten its lifespan by aging itself faster. And it, now you see heightened aging of telomeres and more stem cell um, maintenance gets lost and we have lower longevity protein. So we're aging faster to be able to burn off our, to run our furnace at a higher rate so if a person is overweight, they haven't just eaten enough food to become overweight, they've eaten enough food to become overweight and to increase their metabolism to age faster. So we're trying to eat less food. And I'm saying we're, we're not trying to speed up our metabolic rates here so we, can, um, so we can eat more food and not get fat. We're trying to slow down our metabolic rate so we can eat less food and not get too thin. These are the secrets to maximizing human longevity. And so keep in mind that in the normal range of free T4 of thyroid function, we see half the heart attacks and arrhythmias, abnormal arrhythmias in the lower half of normal of free T4. When we're even when we're medicating somebody with um, hypothyroidism, we, want to, we don't want to keep their, we don't want to suppress their TSH too low. Matter of fact, probably ideally to keep their TSH between two and four, not between zero and two. Um, but in any case, we're just talking about these fallacies and, and things that people are thinking about trying to speed up the metabolism when they really should be trying to slow it down and eating, eating less calories somewhat slowers it down. We're saying here that um, for every hundred calories increase in metabolic rate from overeating, we see the risk of death increases and being overweight increases all cause of mortality. It includes heart attacks, strokes, cancers, dementia, depression. And, um, and so, you know, we're um, in any case, um, as we eat more concentrated calories, particularly we're talking here about sweeteners, white flour, and oil as having high caloric concentration with no fiber. And as we have these calories rush into the bloodstream of strong caloric concentration, particularly I'm um, considering white flour is to be a sugar equivalent because it almost has the same glycemic load as eating a sugar cube. So what, what we're, so the point here is that when these things rush into the bloodstream with an abnormal amount of calories, it doesn't just turn on fat storage enzymes, it also stimulates dopamine centers in the brain in the same areas that are turned on by opiates. And it makes people more dopamine dependent and more be start to become a food addict. They crave more calories and then over time become dopamine sensitive. So they're now desirous of overeating and they're always thinking of you know, stoking their flames with more concentrated calories, and they don't feel satisfied with an apple. They need the bagel, they need the pretzel, they need the pizza, they need the burger, they need the fried foods, they need the oils, they need the concentrated calories, because low density calories aren't as satisfying to them anymore. Whereas these high fiber, lower calorie foods in a person with normal metabolism, or of course, a person who's eating healthier, it starts to become very satisfying and filling to them because they're flooding their nutrient receptor centers and the fibers are broken down by beneficial bacteria in the gut, which change short chain fatty acid. Butyrate is the short chain fatty acid that controls the apostat and the hypothalamus, which is a fiber breakdown product. So of course, the more short chain fatty acids, the more variety of different foods, of different plant materials and different plant fibers we eat, the less calories we desire. And these plant foods are, these high volume plant foods are very low in calories. They're less, way less than hundred calories per pound. How many pounds can you think you can fit into the human stomach at a time? You know, you can't, you know, raw vegetables and cooked greens and fresh fruits like this and non-green vegetables that are, that are really super low in calories. So people that are diabetic and looking to lose weight and put the, get their metabolism under control can eat, don't have to eat thimble-sized portions of food. They can eat large volumes, good-sized portions of food that are low in calories and feel satiated, um, like mushrooms, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, onions, cauliflower. You can put 4,000 calories of oil or if 2,000 calories of chicken in the stomach. You know, the stomach holds about a liter of food, but you can't get more than 400 calories of vegetables in the stomach without feeling uncomfortable. 
If I was Tarzan living with the gorillas in the woods, I couldn't even get enough calories because the greens are so low in calories that you'd feel too full and your jaw would get tired. The point is it's easy to lose weight when you try to just modulate your consumption of high nutrient, lower calorie foods. And that's what we do. We say to people, you wanna lose more weight, you're not losing weight adequately enough. And we say, and I'm telling people if they're not losing at least two pounds a week and they're overweight, they're not following this program. And they modulate their intake of greens and onions and mushrooms and berries. And to get to, if they're not losing weight, they eat more of those foods and less more concentrated calories. And they can control their weight and get their diabetes under control. Um, I just had a woman here who came in, who was here at my retreat. She stayed for, we usually keep people here like two to a few months. And now she's on her sixth month. It's like, which anyway, she was, um, 280 pounds when she came in. And now she's been here, I think, you know, five months going on to her sixth month. And now she's 190 pounds. So she lost, um, about, about 90 pounds. But the point is, is that the first month she wasn't on insulin, but her sugars were still, you know, I took her off all the drugs. She was on, I think, 50 units of insulin when she came in and plus on and some glucosinurias, which she had to come off of. But, and blood, so her blood pressure resolved quickly. She came off the need for those drugs, but was still running elevated insulin between, one, between 115 and I'd say 140 the first um, two months she was here. And now her sugars run, you know, 75, 72, 82, you know, on no medication. Um, not even metformin at this point, but so, but in any case, it's amazing how all of a sudden they pass a certain line of weight and of health and everything like flips over and goes in a different direction, you know, but anyway, green vegetables protect DNA, green vegetables in particular are the most DNA modulating foods, particularly green cruciferous vegetables. The green cruciferous vegetables create these ITCs, isothiocyanides, the more you chew them and they form in the mouth from breaking down the cell wall, there's an enzyme called myrosinase in the cell wall of green vegetables, green cruciferous, which then catalyzes the production of the ITCs, which are very, which help reduce methylation defects and methylation accumulation, methylation defect accumulation that leads gradually leads to cancer, right? So we're talking here like the study on the Fiji Islanders who all smoke practically, and they don't have much, they have very low risks of lung cancer because they eat a lot of green vegetables in Fiji. Can you compare that to the Hawaiian Islanders who don't smoke hardly at all and have still have more lung cancer than the Fiji Islanders because the Hawaiian Islanders don't have much green vegetables in their diet. And we know that the raw vegetable consumption, like eating salad, has the most consistent and powerful association with the reduction of cancers of all type. I, I recommend people have a salad of you know, lettuce and then some other raw green, green cruciferous mixed in, I tell them make salad the main dish at least one meal a day, not a little six inch soup bowl, but a full nine inch serving bowl and half lettuce and half maybe some cruciferous green like watercress or arugula or kale or bok choy, you know, put the shredded cabbage, you know, onions or scallions on top with a dressing that's made healthfully from nuts and seed as the fat source, not as oil. I'm saying oil is absorbed so rapidly it's 120 calories a teaspoon. I'm sorry, it's 120 calories a tablespoon. The average American consumes between 400 and 500 calories a day from oil alone. There's no person, way a person could lose weight eating all that oil. The oil, because it's absorbed so rapidly, immediately stops fat loss, turns up fat storage hormones. You can't be putting fat in and taking fat out efficiently at the same time. It actually inhibits fat loss for days after consuming the oil. And you don't just consume the extra oil, the extra calories from the oil. Oil is also an appetite stimulant and a, and a food that stimulates caloric increases and, and actually food addiction. And of course, people know fried foods are linked to autoimmune conditions like Crohn's disease and colitis and you know, fried foods will lead to cancer. You know? and in any case, we want a high vegetable diet. And the reason I'm going into this oil tangent was because I'm saying that we make salad dressings from tomato sauce and almonds and sesame seeds and a little fig vinegar in there or oranges with blood orange vinegar and lemon and toast, you know, and cashew nuts. And other we're making delicious tasting salad dressing utilizing whole nuts and seeds because nuts and seeds obviously are show about a 40% reduction in cardiovascular mortality when people eat more nuts and seeds and then take the oil out. And of course, even if they don't take the oil, just eating nuts and seeds protects cardiovascular health, but it's linked to about a 30% increase in all cause mortality and about a 40% increase in, in cardiovascular mortality. And the women's, the wheel study, the women's healthy eating and living study showed that even though vegetables were the most protective against cancer, both preventatively and for women who were followed who had cancer, 
in both. In other words, these studies that have been coming out in the last decade have shown the same foods that prevent cancer show enhancement in lifespan, reduction of recurrence of cancer and reduction of cancer deaths in, in people who have cancer. And the most anti-cancer foods on the dietary landscape, I um, have people memorized by this acronym G-BOMBS, G-B-O-M-B-S, G-BOMBS, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, which we're gonna talk about here. And by the way, you see it says fruits and vegetables were more powerful than just vegetables alone. Getting back to that second principle, which has to do with nutritional variety and access. I'm saying we have an unprecedented opportunity in human history to have access to all these superfoods that weren't available to our ancestors. Even when I was a kid, you couldn't get frozen wild blueberries and microgreens and, and baby, you know, baby lettuces and you know, baby bok choy and kales and seven different mushroom varieties. And we never had access to this healthy stuff in the local supermarkets. When we were younger, we have so much um, opportunity, these great foods. And of course, I'm saying that vegetables have the most protection against cancer. Vegetables have the most protection against heart attack. They increase elasticity. They prevent aging of tissues. They stimulate the NRF2 receptors that activate. The NRF2 um, transcription proteins activate the ARE, the antioxidant response element of cells that help cells um, remove repair and remove toxins, metabolic waste products, and of course, prevent the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, reduce the stickiness of cholesterol stickiness and help accelerate removal of plaque, of soft plaque when you eat more green vegetables. So green's really where the money's at. And we're talking here also about heart disease where these, not just these five studies, but more than a dozen studies from involving the work of many hundreds of researchers around the world show that that the human body is designed to be eating um, its macronutrients or calories in whole food form, not in processed foods form. It means eat the apple and the berry and the mango. Don't have apple juice or sugar derived from an apple. Don't have like apple sugar, have the whole apple. Don't have avocado oil, eat the whole avocado. Every nutritional scientist in the world will recognize and show studies to demonstrate that walnuts are more protective than walnut oil and that sesame seeds are a better food than sesame oil and, and, and pecans are a better food than pecan oil. We're trying to use these whole foods for numerous reasons, the lignans, the flavonoids, the fibers, but also when you eat nuts and seeds in the whole food form, all the fat and all the calories don't come into the body. These fat binders carry fat out into the toilet bowl. So the, the calories are not all biologically accessible and these fat magnets, that work in the gut suck oxidized LDL out of the, out of the bloodstream into the digestive tract for removal in the stool. So we see dramatic reduction in LDL cholesterol, particularly oxidized LDL. Nuts and seeds have a dramatic anti-seizure effect and anti-arrhythmic effect. We saw this in the physician's health study where there's a 60% reduction in sudden cardiac death where they did autopsies and did historical reviews of the causes of death to see if the person died very rapidly on the spot. And that was the quick call, you know, not the, um, so where they all of a sudden they were awake and alert one minute, the next minute they were dead. So we're saying the powerful anti-arrhythmic effect of utilizing nuts and seeds. And of course, they really help to prevent and reverse heart disease by lowering LDL and helping um, retain and restore vascular elasticity, which is critically important here. So here's a study from, the, um, from 2015, which, corroborate the Adventist Health Study 1 that there was about a 40% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Then the Adventist Health Study 2 came out, published in 2018, which also showed a 40% reduction in cardiovascular mortality from the inclusion of nuts and seeds a day. But interestingly, it was effective in every cohort, including old, young, you know, Caucasian, Asian, um, Black, um, men, women, vegans, flexitarians, non-vegans. In other words, the Adventist Health Study 2 was such a, such a critical ongoing study because most of the people in this cohort are plant-based eaters eating either total vegan diets or diets that have smaller amounts of animal products in them. So they can measure the difference in outcomes between people with lower amounts of animal products compared to larger amounts or none and compared to other studies which, have a, which don't have as much 
um, differences between the individuals, so it's hard to study the outcomes. And what they found here, of course, in every grouping, there was a reduction in death from with increased nuts and seeds. And as you can see, the American consumption pie is we're eating so much grain and oils and sweets and so little vegetables, only 2% of the American diet when vegetables by volume should be most of what we eat and by caloric intake should be like 30 to 50, at least 30% of what we eat. So we should be eating, we're a vegetable dependent animal. So that, so we reviewed just now the, the first principle of a nutritarian diet, the second principle, we touched on it a little bit, but it has to do with hormonally being hormonally favorable. And we touched on it a little bit saying when you gain weight, and your diet is more glycemically unfavorable, which raises insulin, then you're gonna become more insulin resistant because body fat makes you more insulin resistant, especially when you consume saturated fats because saturated fats distort the insulin receptor and make it not function normally. So if people go on these keto diets, for example, they just eat meat and cheese or eggs or coconut oil or whatever they're eating. And they think because their sugars look good, they're okay. But the minute they eat a mango or a piece of oatmeal, their sugars go through the roof because they've destroyed their insulin receptors with a high saturated fat intake. So they really don't tolerate now carbohydrates. They get too high of a glucose response. And of course we know those diets are exceedingly dangerous. We're gonna go into some of those studies right now, how unsafe these low carbohydrate, high protein diets are as a weight loss methodology. Um, so we're talking about a diet that hormonally favorable and the, the two hormones we're talking about right now are insulin and insulin-like growth factor one or IGF-1. And we know that the hallmark of a healthy centenarian is that they have a high insulin sensitivity and they have low insulin resistance and that they have favor low favorable ranges of IGF-1. Americans, you know, meat-eating Americans traditionally have IGF-1s above 250 where lifespan favorable IGF-1s are usually between 100 and 150, not over 250. So we're talking here, first of all, the glycemic load, the word glycemic load, many of you know, is how fast the glucose calories into the bloodstream. I was referring to how fast the calories into the bloodstream to the oil compared to getting the fat from the whole food, like a nut, which were the calories, where the fat calories enter only one to two calories a minute. So the body can preferentially burn it for energy and not store it as fat. When you have a 50 to 100 calories come in in a minute, you can't burn it for energy, right? Your body preferentially burns calories in the bloodstream for energy before it breaks down glycogen and fat stores. But but if it, but and then it's not going to but it's not going it's going to store fat, of course. So we want the calories to come into the bloodstream slowly. So the glycemic load has to do with how fast the calories come into the bloodstream. For example, if you eat beans. They come in so slowly, the calories, that they don't have much of an insulin requirement because they're coming in over a few hour, over a two to three hour period. And we know that the glycemic load of the diet, total diet increases risk of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, right? And, and of course, aging of the brain. And I'm repeating here that the insulin resistance is from multiple sources, you know, from the bad bacteria. You don't have the good growth of the good bacteria in the gut. And you can't just take probiotics or um, to get good bacteria in the gut. You have to eat the healthy fibers. And we're finding that the higher, the more variety of fibers, of fibers, different fibers we consume makes for a thickened biofilm that covers the villi in the small intestines that take a permanent, you know, inhabitant there. And then the, the, the scientists call this the second meal effect, which means when you have that mango or pineapple or oats in the morning, the glycemic load of that meal is blunted because of the bacterial um, biofilm on the villi, which now slows the absorption of glucose because you regularly eating these four foods that produce the healthiest microbiome. And the four foods, of course, which we mentioned G-bombs, include these two raw foods, raw onion and scallion and raw green vegetables, even lettuce is the richest source of sulfoquinibos, which is one of the major fuels for the growth of the healthiest microbiome. So the lowly lettuce, just a plain green Boston lettuce in your salad is benefiting, has tremendous health benefits. And the two cooked foods are, you know, well-cooked beans and cooked mushrooms, you know, because cooked mushrooms are um, very beneficial. You don't deactivate or denature the anti-cancer compounds and mushrooms are the richest source of ergotheanine, and there are ergothenine receptors in the cell surface of most of our cells, 
which help then stabilize the DNA and prevent the cells from aging prematurely. And here we're saying that's the opposite. We want insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance promoted by body fat, saturated fat, gram negative bacteria that build up from more meat in the diet and more acidic foods. You know, So we're talking here, looking at plant foods, the glycemic load of plant foods, the highest things are you know, white rice, white potato and white flour. I'm saying white flour is a sugar equivalent. It's not a food, it's a drug. It stimulates drug receptors in the brain. It ages brain cells and causes addictive and, and damage to the body. So I'm saying you can't, the, so these medium glycemic foods become somewhat lower glycemic. How do you make you know, oats, wheat, and mangoes lower glycemic? You eat the G-bombs and the foods that increase the biofilm thickness and adherence you know, to, and you, and you eat more of these lower glycemic called plant foods like beans and fruits and squashes and greens and, and, and berries and things, you know, so we eat, so most of these um, plant foods, even then they contain sugar, like certain fruits, they're still very low glycemic and they're so rich in flavonoids that they, and bioflavonoids that they activate, that they're favorable to the growth of bacteria in the gut. So scoring carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of quality, we see that beans as a whole have the most slowly digestible starches and they're highest in resistant starch too, and fiber too, and highest in anti-cancer nutrients too, like anositol penticus phosphate, which activates the immune system recognition of abnormal cells to induce apoptosis in precancerous cells. Beans are particularly um, um, superior source of carbohydrate and they're rich in protein and their protein richness is enhanced because the resistant starch component is counted as a calorie, which doesn't get absorbed. In other words, if let's say if a black bean or a red kidney bean is 30% protein, but now we know that the 10% you know, fat, 60% carbohydrate, 30% protein, but out of the 60% carbohydrate, 10 or to 15% of those carbohydrates don't become absorbed. The resistant starch, they pass through into the toilet bowl. They get breaking down by bacteria in the gut into short chain fatty acids, but they so far down in the proximal portion of the, or the distal portion of the small intestines right at the end and the proximal portion of the colon that most 90% of those calories go through you into the toilet. So all the calories from beans satiated you, made you feel like you ate enough food, but now they don't even get absorbed into the bloodstream. So the actual percent of protein in a bean is more than the 30% listed as a total um, protein percent because 10 per 15% of the carbohydrate calories never came in. So it's really close to the, you know, 38% protein, which is higher than meat, higher than most meats. But in any case, we're talking that beans are an excellent source of protein they are the highest source of resistant starch and fiber. They're linked in all longevity studies to longer lifespan, and they have powerful anti-cancer effects and they're very satiating. So with people who have metabolic hindrance to weight loss, diabetes, or, meta or, or have heart disease or overweight condition, we feed them beans as their major source of carbohydrates, not potatoes and bread and, and, um, and sweet potato as much. You know, we have some of those foods, but we use, minimize those foods. Like for example, we make a great uh, mashed potato out of eight cups of cauliflower with one Yukon gold potato with roasted garlic and chopped spinach and fried onion that we fry in a pan with just water saute them until they start to, we make the pan very hot first. So the onions don't stick to the pan, it's really hot. And then you throw these chopped onions in the pan so it's sizzling off the pan, you know, mixing it with a wooden spatula and then mixing that with the, you know, mash, with, a, with a mashed potato, with a one potato to eight cups of cauliflower. People think it's the best mashed potato I ever tasted where it's 80%, where it's 80, 90% cauliflower. So it's lower glycemic. Okay, and then, we move on to this animal protein idea, which what I'm saying here is that animal protein is the primary driver of abnormally high levels of IGF-1, a growth hormone linked to higher rates of cancer. It's lower levels of IGF-1, not excessively low, because we know that we want to have a diet rich in, enough with sufficient plant protein, sufficient plant protein. But I'm saying one of the most critical and surprising findings from the scientific literature over the last decade is that more plant protein in the diet leads to a longer life and more animal protein in the diet leads to a shortened lifespan and higher can particularly higher cancer rates. We know that there's a very excellent correlation between elevated levels of IGF-1 and higher rates of cancer and dairy products are the most IGF-1 promoting. But of course, 
um, animal protein in general raises IGF-1, not the animal fat. And plant proteins, like from beans we're talking about, or nuts and seeds and green vegetables, don't raise IGF-1 because they're not as biologically complete. And it's hard to overshoot your protein requirements and get too high. It's the excess protein the body can't use that's shunted to IGF-1 production. So with animal protein, it's very easy to overeat the amount of protein the body needs and you have it shunted to IGF-1. And of course, higher levels are increased to breast, prostate, and colon cancer. Like here's a study published in um, Lancet Oncology. No, no, this was um, no, this was British Medical Journal 2012. Excuse me, British Medical Journal 2012, which followed large numbers of people, more than 100,000 people, eating various levels of carbohydrate and protein in their diet, and they followed people, you know, with low sugar diets, and in, in any case, they found that the more animal protein they ate, and the more they reduced their plant carbohydrate consumption the higher the risk of animal products. So they gave them a score of zero to 20 based on how many animal products they consume as a, as a percent of total calories. People with 20 were like on keto or like Atkins type diets and had the highest risk of early life death. And people, as they moved the diet to the lower numbers, five and below, we showed dramatic reductions of cardiovascular death. This information has been corroborated by multiple long-term studies and we give studies more credence if they have larger numbers of people and they follow people for more than 20 years to when they have enough people who die so we can compare the, the diets to the age of death. Here's a study, for example, published in, in Cell Metabolism in 2014, show that these high protein diets had a, a fourfold increase in cancer deaths and a 75 increase in overall deaths over the 18 year period. So it took 50 to 65 year olds and followed them for 18 years. And here's another study that showed the, of course, a 73% increase in developing diabetes in the higher protein group. Same thing, we found this in the study published in Lancet Public Health in 2018. We had a 25 year medium follow up with more than 6,000 deaths. So the lowest carbo the lower carbohydrate diets with more animal products had the most early life deaths and a tremendous dose response relationship, which we've seen now in one study being corroborated by other studies showing more plant protein, more hemp seeds, more sunflower seeds, more soybeans, more red beans, more broccoli, more, you know, the because the primary protein rich plant foods are green vegetables, which are about 40% protein, beans, which are 30 to 35% protein, and, um, and nuts and seeds, you know, which sunflower seeds like more than 20% protein, pine nuts, you know, more than 30% protein. We're talking about um, greens, beans, and nuts and seeds, and more greens, beans, and nuts and seeds, of course, means a lower glycemic effect of the diet too. So more higher protein plant would lead for longer life. And we're talking here about the effect on longevity proteins, whereas CERT1 and AMP kinase are elevated. They stabilize stem cells and telomeres. And we can now have the, these majorly, it's amazing, we're doing these research tools. I'm doing a study now where we're tracking 100 women um, who follow this super healthy diet and we're measuring their longevity proteins. And we have these epigenetic changes and methylation defects and telomeres we can measure. So we have the ability to technology actually give a person a, a biological age and predict their age of death by how healthy these markers of aging are. We're seeing how that what, what gives us these healthy markers of aging are phytochemical exposure from colorful plants, regular exercise and moderate caloric restriction. We're not saying extreme caloric restriction, the person's anorexic, we're saying moderate caloric restriction, you know, so you keep your BMI, a favorable BMI, probably below 22 for a male and below 21 for a female is ideal, but not obviously going below 18. Anyway, the, and we're talking about how we increase mTOR and other markers of premature death. mTOR is elevated in like a thousand, is hundred percent of invasive cancers. We have elevation of mTOR and mTOR elevation from poor dietary and lifestyle habits and increase insulin resistance and cancer promoting genes and activate and allow cancer promoting genes and genetic defects to be, to have full reign and to express themselves. More oxidative stress means more free radicals, right? They react more reactive oxygen species. When you eat sugar, you can't efficiently turn it into energy because you need cofactors, vitamins and minerals to, for, this, for the mitochondria to process it. So it doesn't produce energy well, it gets shunted to fat storage and it leaves you fatigued while you're becoming overweight and you're stripping your body of nutrients and flooding your body with toxins like reactive oxygen species because you couldn't, because you generate reactions with oxygen species when you take in calories that do not contain antioxidants that are there to diffuse the production of the free radicals from metabolizing calories. 
So we're talking here about excess animal protein, excessive calories in general, and high glycemic carbohydrates as markedly accelerate aging. And here's my G-bomb slide, right? For greens and beans and onions and mushrooms and berries and seeds. And we can throw a dart here at any of those foods, but I don't have too much time to go into detail on them. But I can just give an example, like study on women with mushrooms, sort of 64% lower rate of developing breast cancer from people who ate 10 grams of mushrooms on the average a day. And for example, there was a study with women who had breast cancer followed for 10 years. And those who had a, about a third of a milligram of lignin from seeds and we're talking about the seeds with the highest lignin content or, or um, flax seeds and chia seeds. In that study over 10 years, sort of 71% decreased death from breast cancer in women in the higher lignin in intake from just a touch of seeds, hardly a little bit. They didn't even eat the rest of the G-bonds. You know, we're talking, and they didn't do it earlier in life when it could be most protective. We're talking about food has tremendous power to control people's health destiny. Here's a study on a, over 100,000 Asian adults showing a, that there's no threshold effect with green vegetables. The more green vegetables eaten, the longer people lived, and the, the, centen the healthy centenarians were marked by those that ate the most green vegetables. And we are a green vegetable dependent animal like the other primates. If you don't like green vegetables, you better get one of those condos next to a hospital. You know, it's funny because I like to go skiing and I see these expensive condos and expensive homes right off the ski slopes. I'm saying they should build condos and super homes like that right next to hospitals for people who want to eat fast food and eat bread and bagels and pizza and, and, you know, and white bed and commercial baked goods and all that stuff. They should just build them a house right in the hospital. They can just go back and forth across the street if that's what they wanted to. So I'm saying here that you can't have a normal immune system. You can't protect against infectious agents like COVID because the largest part of our lymphocyte population lines of the villi and the gut and, it's, and the immune surveillance and the aryl hydrocarbon receptors are stimulated by the cruciferous, by green vegetables, right? The intraepithelial lymphocytes are whose development is stimulated by the aryl hydrocarbon receptors and the green by green vegetable consumption. We have failure to maintain adequate immune surveillance and function if we don't eat sufficient green vegetables. You can't be healthy. You can't take a green vegetable dependent animal like a primate and expect them not to develop serious chronic disease if they don't eat enough green vegetables. So we have, so that salad today is critical. So I'm saying here, and I'm, my, I'm advocating more greens, both raw and cooked, more beans is a major source of carbohydrate and more nuts and seeds and removing processed oils in the diet, including olive oil. And I'll make the radical, state, the radical statement right now that olive oil is a cancer promoter. And the reason I can say olive oil is a cancer promoter is because if people are consuming, if the average American is consuming 400 to 500 calories from oil a day, and many people consuming more than a thousand calories from oil a day and contributing to and promoting more body fat and body fat is a major cancer promoter. And since olive oil promotes and maintains body fat compared to eating an olive, right? Or something like that, something that was, um, that was a whole food, then we can see that that contributes overall to, the, to their risk of cancer. So we're talking about um, lowering the glycemic load, reducing diabetic and cardiovascular parameters. Here's a study done on the nutritarian diet by the David Jenkins group in Toronto, which showed that following this dietary portfolio reduced LDL cholesterol by 33% in just six weeks time. And it wiped out oxidized LDL, almost no oxidized LDL. And oxidized LDL is the worst actor here that you can measure, even compared to you know, other diets or even statin drugs don't lower cholesterol or oxidized cholesterol, especially people get side effects, don't take them, they cause weight gain, they cause fatigue, and they worsen diabetes control. Whereas a nutritarian diet didn't just lower blood, lower LDL cholesterol, it wiped, it increased vascular elasticity, it lowered blood pressure, it reduced free radicals, it reduced inflammation, it normalizes the CRP, it, it takes, it does so many thousands of beneficial factors reducing heart attack risk. Here's a study on 400 people, more than 400 people followed for six months where it dropped their systolic blood pressure 26 points. But this was dropping at 26 points when the physicians taking care of the patients were taking the medications away. So the level of 120 at the end was off medication, though average blood pressure of 147, many of those people were on medications. People claim this low sodium DASH diet as the most blood pressure effective lowering diet, which is really not true, but that's just because they don't study a nutritarian diet. I'm not as, not as, this diet style is not as popular. 
and well known, but that but the low stone dash diet only lowers blood pressure 11 degrees mercury. Here's this diabetic research study on this protocol showed it in the diabetic research study where 90% of the medications were taken away within six months and 90% of the people with diabetes became non-diabetic within six months. The mean hemoglobin I see in the study went from 8.2 to 5.8, but the blood pressure dropped 27 points too, almost the same as the other study showed. And of course, what I'm saying here is my nutritarian pyramid has vegetables at the base. And if a person is choosing to use animal products, and they're using it in a small amount, like a flavoring or a condiment, not as a major source of calories. And some people who are food addicts just do better when they're eliminating oils and sugars and don't even dabble in those foods. And we, I have a retreat in California in my practice right now. Instead of just seeing patients, I really um, have retired out of my full-time medical practice at this point. Whereas I do see patients regularly, but I, they, people are coming to my retreat and staying for at least 30 days. So instead of coming for one hour visit, they stay for a couple of month visit. So I'm able to really impart their food addictions, change the way they think, think their view of the world and all the drivers, the emotional drivers to overeat and have them have a really good understanding and retrain their taste muscle. So they prefer eating healthy foods. And it's amazing over time, how this way becomes a way they prefer to eat and enjoy eating just as much when they learn the recipes and have a chance for the taste buds to change. And they have enforced abstinence away from their addictive triggers long enough. You know, it's like almost like a drug rehab center, but with the food, what are the food of these people are, are committing self-destructive behavior with, there is food, not drugs. So a nutritarian eats a wide variety of high nutrient plants. We don't eat empty calorie foods like sugar and white flour, sweeteners, fast foods. There's a dose dependent relationship between the consumption of sugar and commercial baked goods and fast food with depression as well, and you almost have universal dysthymia across America with people eating so much junk and fast food and little or no oil and little or no animal products. And so the prescription here is to eat at least a half a cup of beans every day, at least three fresh fruits, at least one and a half ounces of nuts and seeds a day and remove the oil. Most of us who are very physically fit and more physically active are eating more nuts and seeds than that to maintain more calories. We're probably, myself, I'm probably eating two to three ounces of nuts and seeds a day, not one and a half ounces, but the people I see are mostly overweight. So I limit their calories a bit. I'm reading large, one large salad every day and steamed in wok greens and Thai wok sauces and Thai curry sauces and all types of new flavorings and mushrooms and onions sufficiently and every single day in our diet, different types of mushrooms, not just one type. And I'm saying here, pushing that envelope of human longevity doesn't just extend lifespan. It gives you such a tremendous gain in healthy life expectancy. I have so many of my patients over the last 40 years have come to me in their later years in bad health, maybe with, you know, telling me they need stents, where I said, follow this and go back to the cardiologist and redo the stress test in four to five months. You'll see how much it improves. And these people have gone on to live to be 95 to 105 years old without stents and without, with heart disease and on no blood pressure medications, removing their blood pressure back to normal. Um, so I have a lot of these examples here for just to show, because this is the fun part of, you know, my, the fun pleasure of watching people make radical changes and getting well. And here's Steve and Tara. Of course, Steve got rid of his diabetes and and his sleep apnea and, and Tara, Tara her frequent sinus infections and eczema and psoriasis. And of course, then the 80 refers to that means in the first year, Tara lost 80 pounds. She weighed 226. In year one, Steve lost 220 pounds in year one, got rid of his, all his men. Their daughter, Chloe, got rid of her asthma and lost 32 pounds. And you can see them right there. And you know who's like super thrilled about this? Not just them, the dog. Take a look. The, 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 now he has finally has room to sit in the car. It's funny because I can't, um, I, when I give a lecture, I'm not live and I can't hear the response of the audience. It's like, I'm just talking to a screen. It's kind of weird, you know, I'm giving jokes and talking to a screen. Anyway, here's Emily one year later, lost about hundred pounds. And I just want to show you a close up of her face to say how much younger she looks one year later, right? With all the help, not just weight loss, you can see the orange tinge of her skin from all the heightened colorful flavonoids and bioflavonoids and, and the vegetables and the carotenoids, right? You can see the skin tone, texture, and color improves. And we do see people age backwards routinely because we measure, if we're measuring their telomeres and we're redoing the telomere measurement a year or six months later, they show that the biological age improved. 
So people laugh and say, you can't age backwards, but these people are, are demonstrating that they can actually reduce their actual biological age as measured by epigenetic changes in telomeres. And here's Sarah who got rid of multiple sclerosis, lost hundred pounds. And John, who when they first met and did this together, they weren't married. And he met this woman, started dating her with multiple sclerosis and he lost 160 pounds. She lost hundred pounds and getting rid of their, their multiple sclerosis. And I was claiming that this is a better than um, the bachelor, right? Because they, because they ate this way and they came together and got married. Kind of cool, right? And here's Sandra who lost, who went from 252 to 115 pounds. That's like way over hundred pounds. That's like 140 pounds weight loss. She got rid of course her diabetes and her migraines and her um, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And here's Kelly who resolved her autoimmune hepatitis. Um, she was told she needed a liver transplant. Of course, she came back to normal. She's reading one of my t-shirts that kale, says kale is a new beef. And here's April who got rid of her multiple sclerosis and lost 40 pounds. And I'll give you, and here's Janet who got lost over hundred pounds and got rid of her MS as well. Off the steroids, no more migraines, no more, um, no more high blood pressure medications. Here's David who lost 155 pounds in one year and resolved his diabetes and depression. And of course, let me read a couple of what these couple of these comments were because we'll finish this up and take your questions in a few minutes. But here's 41 years old, they weighed 330 pounds spent most days in bed, migraines, sleep apnea, depression, anxiety, severe cramping in my legs. So many of the, my people who come to see me don't just have cramping in their legs, but they have restless legs and often taking drugs for restless legs, um, which go away, obviously. Um, especially at night, these restless legs at night, cramping, which prevents sleep and cause issues with walking, digestive problems, gas, bloating, rectal bleeding, boils, acne, skin tags, skin infections, brain fog, um, hemoglobin A1C of 11.4. No wonder she had, he had brain fog with a hemoglobin A1C of 11.4. As I followed Dr. Furman's nutrient-dense plant-rich eating style, I lost my cravings for unhealthy food, started craving greens and salads, dropped 155 pounds in a year. My health was transformed. No diabetes, no depression, no anxiety. No longer needed a sleep apnea machine. Skin tags and rashes gone, migraines gone. And now I weigh 175. Every day is an adventure, new lease on life. Here's Vivian with a triglycerides over 5,000, almost died of acute pancreatitis with uncontrolled diabetes. Got rid of, of course, her diabetes and her condition. Here's Howard, he was a doctor at my local hospital in New Jersey. And he was an anesthesiologist who was quitting his career because he couldn't concentrate during surgeries because we get such high and lows. And he, when I told him, he was, he came to me and I told him he's using too much insulin a day. He's got to change his diet. And he went from using 80 to hundred units of insulin a day to only requiring 20, about 20 units of insulin a day. And of course you can see he became ripped and healthy and got back to his job again and be able to work as a doctor in the emergency room, feeling good without any, ever getting highs and lows anymore. So he's a, a really great success story. Here's Michael as a fantastic story. Um, admitted in December. Berman, I want to be able to leave a few questions towards the end. And we have I'll wrap this up within two minutes. How about, is that good? Yes. Okay. I'm just telling these last two stories. Cause of course I'm, you know, excited about the outcome of these individuals. I think they just make a great point. Cause this guy had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which doctors say can't be reversed. Right. So we had heart failure due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with uncontrolled diabetes and a heart attack with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 20%, which came back to normal. My um, father-in-law had a heart attack with an ejection fraction of 25%, which also came back to normal when he changed his diet after his heart attack, of course. But anyway, he failed attempts to bring the heart to control with radiofrequency ablation, cardioversions, thought that he was dying in the hospital. Of course, he changed his, what he, they, brought, they let him bring the food into the hospital, you know, and, and start to eat the program. And he was weaned off his insulin. He started to feel better. He could be able to go home and walk again. And of course, then three years later, his left ventricular remodel did no longer had um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, normal size, a direction fraction came back to normal, not needing any medications off 20 different drugs, no more diabetes, no more retinal damage. And the, even the intraocular heightened pressure returned to normal. Um, oh, here's, oh, here, I have two more slides. Here's, um, here's Carol, who weighed, went from 350 to 120. And, um, and here's Martin, who at age 66, he was near death. He, of course, also had an enlarged heart, um, congestive heart failure with edema on 11 medications. And of course, now he lost, He's now 70 years old, lost 120 pounds on lays 146 and has no medication, heart rhythm back to normal. 
Noah Dean, he's now a certified health coach working at the Mayo Clinic. All right, um, I'm, I finished. We have some time to do Q and A now. I know, I know, I kind of had a rush and go so fast, but I thought it was good questions. to present a good, you know, good amount of information. Okay, I'm going to open the chat box. Push this button down. Is it working? Oh, the chat. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can. After how long do you need to eat G bombs before you start noticing the benefits of the improved gut microbiome and all of kind of the effects you're talking about? Well, you know, people diarrhea at the first week or two. So the first month, sometimes they lose, you know, at least 15 pounds, usually around 20 pounds, but they're not losing all fat. The high acidic and high the toxicity of their former diets make them retain more fluid in their body. So they're losing a lot of fluid the first few weeks and they're immediately um, the first week, week, they can feel a little worse sometimes due to, um, because they're diuresing extra sodium and they become a little hypovolemic because your body, when you're on a high salt diet, the kidney's still excreting excessive amounts of sodium the first week, sometimes even into the second week until the kidney gets better at holding on to sodium from the lower sodium. I'm saying is that um, they start to feel really much better after the first week, they're not feeling better yet. It's the second, after the second week, they feel a lot better. And I say within that two week period, we see inflammatory markers drop. So go down even in overweight people so that their reduced risk of heart attack or having a cardiovascular event is going down by a tremendous percentage, even when they start this diet, when they're still overweight. And so what I'm saying is if you measure the um, CRP, the hey, HSCRP, you measure even est um, estrogen promotion or you measure insulin resistance or insulin requirements, they drop. So even while the person's losing weight, even if it's still overweight, they drop dramatically even the first month of doing this. You don't have to wait until they get to their ideal weight to see benefits, as long as they continue to lose weight. If they start to stop losing and regain again, even at a lower body weight, the regaining, you start to see abnormalities creeping back in again, even when it's not as heavy as they were to initially start. But in the process of losing, you see dramatic benefits while they're still losing. You follow me? Thank you. Other sure. questions? Uh, what modifications do you make uh, to the diet for folks with kidney stones and need to be on a low oxalate diet? It's mostly the modifications. And I, know I do it even for people who don't have kidney stones to degree. We tell people not to eat much raw spinach. For most people who have, don't have a history of kidney stones, they can eat a quarter of their, let's say, salad to be spinach. But for people with kidney stones, they don't eat any raw spinach, but it's mostly spinach, beet leaves, Swiss chard, parsley, and the high oxalate vegetables, particularly raw, we take out of the diet. We give them a little probiotics, B6, and um, extra magnesium at night. And then they also have to actually, we drink a little more water between meals too. And we check the urine, the, you know, the calcium oxalates measurements in their urine too, to make sure they're, they're okay. Um, so yeah, there's slight modification to that if they're a stone former. But keep in mind that it's the animal protein that drives the stone formation, especially the calcium oxalate stones. So with this, the fact that they're moving plant-based and getting rid of the high protein has a huge effect on preventing kidney stone formation. And the question here in the chat box about, it's not the growth hormone given to the animals. We see the same raise in IGF-1 in from the studies done around the world, Australia, all the areas where they're not using commercially based, where the animals are grass raised or pasture raised. So it's, it's not growth hormone giving to animals. It's the, it's the increased level of animal protein. It's because you can do that. You can raise your growth, your IGF-1 with soy protein. You can take isolated soy protein or whey protein as a supplement and drive up IGF-1 to an unfavorable range from excess protein the same way. I see another question. Go right ahead and give it to him. I don't think my mic is working. I'm allowed. Yeah, we've got plenty of time, so I could stay, you know, later and to ask to answer questions, so we can get to every question you guys have. Hopefully. Oh, okay. Never mind. Oh, it does work. Never mind. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, what about wine and resveratrol? I can't say that word. Or uh, seafood. I know you're saying animal meat, but I wanted to. Does that include seafood? Yes, it does. We're suggesting that um, two things. Number one, um, 
that alcohol on almost any level of consumption is still an increased risk of cancer. And the idea that resveratrol and wine was a cardioprotective and the French paradox and all that stuff at this point in history of science has been disproven. There's no significant reduction from, you know, it's a mostly a, um, so what I'm saying, there's no benefit to drink, thinking you can drink wine on your health, that, that alcohol in general increases risk slightly they say that one glass of wine a day for most women, because they're smaller bodies and more alcohol sensitive, probably increases risk of breast cancer approximately 10% in most larger studies. So I don't think there's any justification for advocating the consumption of alcohol, you know, and the same thing with seafood. And we're dumping, you know, tens of thousands of tons of plastic into the ocean every hour. And it used to be the case that the larger, more predatory fish like tuna and swordfish had higher level of toxic metals because they ate more smaller fish. But now we're detecting higher levels of plastic, microplastic compounds in sardines and oysters and smaller fishes as well. And the average American is now consuming, has about a credit card, credit size card, credit card size of plastic in their body, which is those contribute to, to cancer as well. So we're saying that since there's so many negatives to all types of animal products, that when you're choosing to use them, um, then we use them in condiment size flavorings, limiting them to a small amount of ounces per week, usually under six to eight ounces per week. Whereas six to eight ounces is usually considered one serving for many people. When, when they have multiple servings a day, we're saying just use it as, you know, if you want to flavor something, because in larger amounts, you're going to get into problems, especially when you go to the daily consumption of animal products, especially when you're looking at people consuming over four ounces a day, you see, then you see a larger jump in IGF-1 with almost any animal product they eat, including something like halibut or flounder, you still see raising IGF-1 into the level that's not optimally favorable. In order to be respectful of the rest of the schedule, Dr. Furman, I believe that there are some questions you may see on the online and uh, uh, they tell me that you can actually make a response back to any one of them individually if you want to. So if you wanna look at the dialogue of questions of people who were not physically here to talk, uh, they have some questions that were online and you can scroll down and Kathy says that you might be, a, you can make a response back to them if you want to. Oh, Otherwise, you mean this I, thing that says answer, dismissed, open nine? That's the thing I can answer live after we're done. I can click on that and it'll still be open. Yes, right. Will says that's the correct response. Yeah, and you can type, you can type the answer where it says type answer to their, to their questions. Got it, got it, okay. Right. Terrific. Thank you very much. It was very stimulating. Terrific. Good luck, everybody. Right. Sorry I couldn't be there. I had a loss of... Yep. Per That's all right. So sorry and I then... couldn't be there and looking forward to be meeting you all one day. Take care. Can you kill